Good evening, everyone. Uh, warm welcome to this webinar. Uh, you know, we in collaborate. Medgenome is collaborating with Prime Imaging and Prenatal Diagnostic Center, Chandigarh. And uh, this is our uh, second webinar of the series, our sonogenetic webinar series. And the topic is posterior complex, normal, abnormal, and genetics. So, without wasting any further time, I would like to invite Dr. Ladbin Skor, who is the director of Prime Diagnostic Center, uh, Chandigarh, and obviously she needs no introduction. So, I would hand over to Dr. Ladbin. Okay, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Geeta. And uh, this is uh, in continuation with uh, part two of our Sonogenetics uh, webinar series. So, we bring to you today. Uh, very distinguished uh, speakers for this evening to speak on a very important and a crucial area. In addition to what we are looking at, the anterior midline complex and now coming to the posterior midline complex of the brain. So we will have the first uh, speaker that is Dr. Meethan today, who's going to talk on the normal anatomy and the crucial points which are to be required to be seen during the imaging of the fetal head. So she's uh, basically, she's after doing her post-graduation in uh, OBGYN and from Amritsar Medical College, she has been trained as a fellow in fetal medicine from Chennai, Mediscans Chennai under Dr. Suresh. And she of course has achievements of, you know, she has awards and achievements as she has topped the university uh, that includes the Baba Farid University for consecutively three years. And she does hold several distinct distinctions during her MBBS. And she has publications in national and international journals. She does hold society, member of Society of Iswag and Society of Fetal Medicine and Chandigarh Obi Jivain Society. And she too is a member of Foxy. So with that, I would request Dr. Meethan to please uh, uh, talk on today's topic and that is imaging of posterior complex. So over to Dr. Meethan. Right, thank you so much ma'am for a very warm welcome. And uh, this is part two. So I'm going to share, I think my screen is visible now. Yeah. I can start off, right? Yes. All right, great. So very, very warm welcome to everyone. This is part two and we've already discussed part one. We've already taken up uh, anterior uh, midline complex. So we've been uh, seeing the brain very, very closely in the neurosonogenetic series. And we have normal for you. We have abnormal for you as well as very, very importantly, we are going to talk on genetics and we have our genetic expert. Uh, we, we turn our heads uh, for, for everything to her. And we're going to talk about posterior complex today. Uh, we're going to focus more on uh, ventricles here as uh, we're going to talk about genetic counseling in ventricles uh, as we move on. We, I am going to talk uh, just about the normal uh, posterior complex, the normal posterior midline complex. Now, as uh, we've already discussed, we've already taken this up. We know that most organs during fetal period, they just increase in size. Whereas the fetal brain, it undergoes major developmental changes. And these are seen throughout gestation can be picked up on scan. The development of the fetal brain, it starts as early as the third week of intrauterine life. And it is a continuing process until the last weeks of intrauterine gestation as well as postnatally. So if I want to bookmark the fetal brain, if I want to um, call the patient uh, and bookmark or see the fetal brain, because I really cannot scan after every week to see the progress that the fetal brain is making, uh, I would call her number one at 11 to 13 weeks. That is the NTNB or now better known as the first trimester scan or the mini target scan where I see the brain very, very closely. Or I would call her and in fact, I will call her at 18 to 20 weeks for a TIFA scan, a targeted uh, anomaly scan where I can see majority of uh, the development of the brain very, very nicely. And uh, this is where I would pick up uh, major abnormalities. And I think ISOG, we, we all know ISOG is our Bible and it has given us guidelines on how to perform uh, normal uh, fetal brain imaging as well as an extended fetal brain imaging, which is known as a neurosonogram. So it also tells us that the ideal stage to look at the developing fetal brain is 
from 18 to 22 weeks. Axial sections or axial views, as we all know, the transventricular view, the transthalamic view, and the transcerebellar view are the gateway for assessing most of midline anomalies. And whenever there's a strong uh, suspicion of something going wrong, we always move sagittal or coronal, and uh, we go on to an extended neurosonogram. So uh, moving on to the anterior and the posterior midline complex. Now we all know, we've already discussed this, that these are two groups of supratentorial anatomical structures which are reproducible in every transventricular view. Now just a word about uh, just brushing up the anterior midline complex. Uh, we know, we've already discussed in our previous lecture that the anterior midline complex of the brain is made of five structures, the interhemispheric fissure or the midline parks here, the callosal sulcus, which forms a T, the genome of the corpus callosum, the cavum septum pellucidum, or as we discussed, the black brain box of the uh, fetal brain, and laterally, this complex is flanked by the anterior or the frontal horns of the lateral ventricle. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to the talk of the day. This is going to be very, very short and very, very crisp. We're going to talk about the posterior midline complex. Now, as we've discussed the anterior midline complex, the posterior complex is also made of five structures. So this includes the splenium of the corpus callosum, that is the last part of the corpus callosum, the callosal sulcus, which again forms a T here, the interhemispheric fissure or the midline parks, the parieto occipital fissure or the parieto occipital sulcus, and laterally, this is flanked by the medial walls of the lateral ventricle. All right, so I'm going to discuss every structure one by one. First, the splenium of the corpus callosum. We know that the corpus callosum is made of four parts, the rostrum, genu, body, and splenium. Splenium is the last part, and it is very, very important to identify both an axial as well as um, a mid-sagittal view. Why? Because uh, if there is dysgenesis of the corpus callosum or there is partial agenesis of the CC, this is what goes wrong. And splenium overhangs the tectal plate here. So the rostrum, genu, body and the splenium and that's the 3D render of the entire corpus callosum. All right, secondly, the callosal sulcus. Now the callosal sulcus is a reflective pia covering. So that is why it is echogenic on the outer respect of the corpus callosum. So this runs on the roof of the corpus callosum and the pericallosal artery, it runs to, uh, through this uh, sulcus to roof the corpus callosum in its entirety. So this uh, sulcus, callosal sulcus, can be seen anteriorly forming the anterior complex, part of the anterior complex, as well as posteriorly forming part of the posterior complex. Now, the callosal sulcus is an indirect marker for the presence of the corpus callosum in its entirety. So there, if you see, this is the T which we are talking about, the T sign, which is the callosal sulcus. And here, similarly, from frontal, I'm going behind caudally, and I get this T, which is the callosal sulcus. All right. Now, moving on to the lateral ventricles and the ventricular measurement. Now, uh, lateral ventricle uh, is uh, the parts uh, of the lateral ventricle are five. So, first part is the anterior or the frontal horn, the posterior or the occipital horn the inferior or the temporal horn, the body of the lateral ventricle, and the atrium or the trigone, which is the most important part. And this connects the inferior horn, the temporal horn, and the body of the lateral ventricle. Now, the lateral ventricular atrial width, or the LVAW, now we know that the atrium, it connects anteriorly with the body, posteriorly with the posterior horn, and inferiorly to the inferior horn or the temporal horn. It is an excellent measurement to verify the state of the ventricular system. To, uh, so mostly out of all the ventricular, uh, you know, out of all the ventricles of the fetal brain, the lateral ventricle is usually the first to enlarge and the easiest to pick up. It is gestational age independent. The mean remains between 7.6 and a, a deviation of 0.6 mm here and there. And the upper limit, which is gestational age dependent, uh, independent, is 10 mm. 
So the lateral uh, ventricular atrial width or the measurement of the lateral ventricles is seen only and only at the parieto-occipital sulcus, which forms a part of the posterior complex. And we have guidelines for measuring the lateral ventricles, and this is a very good article if you want to go through it. Um, this was published in 2009. This gives us uh, a, a sort of a standardization for the measurement of the lateral ventricles, and it uh, gives us an insight also to uh, mild ventriculomegaly, not so much on gross ventriculomegaly. And uh, according to this article, you can divide, uh, you know, your measurements into five parts, the primary criteria and the secondary criteria, you can give yourself a maximum score of seven. And the primary criteria for measuring lateral ventricles correctly, the first one is that it should be a strict axial plane. So you should have a strict transventricular plane. The midline structure should be equidistant from the proximal as well as the distal calvarial margin. And the midline should be perpendicular to the ultrasound beam. The second is that the, uh, we should be at the adequate anatomical level or the, or, the, or the right section. Now, the anterior landmark for the right section is the CSP or even the fornices, uh, which, which come a little inferiorly. And the posterior landmark is the fluid-filled triangular V-shape of the ambient cistern. Now, from, from here, once I've focused the right plane, I know that the proximal and the distal calvarial margins can be seen clearly. My beam is perpendicular. I can see the CSP. I can see the ambient cistern. I locate the atrium. How do I locate the atrium? I locate the atrium by the internal parieto-occipital sulcus, the POS. This dip right here is the parieto-occipital sulcus. Now, once I've uh, located my atrium, I go on to measure. How do I measure? I take the measurement perpendicular to the inner and outer borders of the ventricle and not the midline fox. So I don't have to be perpendicular here. I have to be perpendicular to the lateral ventricle um, margins. Then I put the caliper on to on. From here to here, I'm going to show you images that are that are suboptimal as well, and uh, we all should know that we have to use adequate zoom or the image size should be adequate, neither too large, neither too small, to measure the ventricles correctly. So here, this is the parieto-occipital sulcus, and here is where I'm going to take my measurement, which is going to be perpendicular to the walls of the lateral ventricle and not the midline fox. All right, so again, picked up from the guidelines. This is how we measure on-to-on -on measurement, not in between, not um, uh, the outer to outer borders. And here I've completely missed the mark of the parieto-occipital sulcus. I've just gone to uh, posteriorly. So again, this is something that is wrong. This uh, the, I've measured from outer to outer end. Here I've measured um, the, the line is perpendicular to the midline fox and not the lateral ventricle. And here I've just missed my mark of the parieto-occipital sulcus. I've gone to uh, posteriorly. Uh, one of the, um, you know, one of the difficulties we face is uh, seeing the near field ventricle, especially now that we are working on, on very, very high end machines, we can actually see the near field ventricle as well. But because of the reverberation artifact, we really miss the near field ventricle and it's equally important to see both the ventricles. So whenever we can't, uh, whenever we can't see the ventricle or the other ventricle, please wait or you see an oblique plane and you just go above and out and you'll get the near field ventricle as well. You can measure the near field ventricle at the level of the parieto-occipital sulcus, or you can wait for the baby to turn. So you can, uh, you can take the right uh, lateral ventricular measurement and you can wait for the baby to change its position and then you can try for the left lateral ventricular measurement. Now to avoid this reverberation artifact or to avoid missing asymmetric ventricles or asymmetric ventricular megaly, there was an article which was published which uh, talked about the coronal approach for the measurement of both the lateral ventricles. Now, is there an advantage? Well, 
0.3 mm larger, the measurements, they are more as compared to the axial plane, number one. It does avoid the near field shadowing, yes, but more expertise is needed in, in this kind of measurements. It's easy to take an MRI picture and measure, but ultrasound, it is a little difficult. And the asymmetry, which is very, very important, is more evident in a coronal approach rather than an axial view. All right, so with that, I'm going to end, end my talk. And the take home message here is that we should always image the anterior as well as the posterior complex in every axial view. view. Most importantly, the anterior complex, not so importantly, the posterior complex, the measurement of the lateral ventricles, the correct plane has to be used. There should be adequate zoom, on-to-on -on measurement, the our measurement should be perpendicular to the ventricular wall and I should be at the level of the parieto occipital sulcus always. Right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Meetan. Thank you for a very well elaborated talk on posterior complex. Now we move on to the next talk. I think we will take up the QA session at the end. So the next speaker is uh, Dr. Divya Singh. Dr. Divya Singh is pr primarily working at uh, our center and she's a consultant radiologist and a fetal medicine specialist. After doing her post-graduation in radiology in PGI, she has been also trained uh, at uh, MediScan Chennai. She's done her fellowship in advanced OBGYN and uh, she has uh, 42 publications to her credit and she has two chapters in the book. And she's also currently a member of ISWOG CME Task Force and a member of online education working group of ISWOG. With that, I would request Dr. Divya Singh to please uh, talk on today's topic, that is abnormalities of the posterior complex. Dr. Divya Singh, please. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for the kind introduction. And uh, uh, I would like to thank everyone for joining us today evening. My task has been simplified by the previous speaker because now we have refreshed our memories regarding the anatomy of the anterior and the posterior complex. And uh, rolling the ball forward, I'll be talking on the abnormalities of the posterior complex. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Uh, if you could just all all right uh, Dr. Dira, everything's fine perfect right now before uh, i start talking about the abnormalities i would first like to establish some ground rules regarding the posterior complex uh, if you see this publication on uh, posterior complex the posterior complex is uh, imaged in a plane which is slightly cranial from the transventricular plane. So uh, tra posterior complex is something that we look for uh, while performing uh, an extended neurosonography. And the classic plane for seeing the posterior complex is actually a bit more cranial to the standard transventricular plane that we use for screening. Now, first question which I would like to uh, raise here before speaking about abnormalities is that, does the normal appearance of the posterior complex change? Well, uh, these are two images showing the posterior complex, one at 22 weeks, that is in the second trimester, and the second in the third trimester. And as you can appreciate, there is some change in the appearance of the posterior complex, mainly because there is cortical maturation in the third trimester, and you can appreciate the uh, sulci, mainly the pericalosal sulcus here posteriorly, outlining the splenium of the corpus callosum much better in the third trimester. Also the parieto occipital sulcus, which we commonly see as this triangular shaped structure in the second trimester becomes more like a crevice because of the development of the adjacent gyri, it becomes more deep. And that's how the posterior complex differs uh, as we advance in gestation. Now, how do you spot an abnormality of the posterior complex? Just as anything else in medicine, if you have to spot uh, an abnormality, you have to have a systematic approach. And when you're looking at the posterior complex, of course, you need to have a look at the lateral ventricle, but you need to look at the ventricle, not only for its size, but also for its shape, the wall for any kind of irregularity. And then you must look inside the ventricle. Look, normally a ventricle should have just an echoic CSF and the echogenic choroid plexus within it. Now you don't confine yourself to the ventricle. You also look at the periventricular brain parenchyma. Then we move to the splenium of the corpus callosum, 
we assess this plenium for its presence or absence, for its thickness, for its echogenicity. As you can appreciate, the normal splenium is this hypoechoic structure. And of course, then we look at the parieto occipital sulcus, we look at its shape, whether it's appropriate for that period of gestation and the adjacent interhemispheric fissure. Now remember, the abnormalities of posterior complex can occur singly, that is only one structure may be abnormal, or they can occur in combination. So when you spot an abnormality in one structure, look at the others carefully. Now, once you know that there is something wrong with the posterior complex, you need to suggest or determine the etiology of that abnormality. And that could range from a structural or developmental cause, that is some aberration in the normal embryonic development. It could occur as a consequence of fetal infection due to genetic causes or could be vascular in origin. Now, coming to the abnormal appearance, first, I would like to speak about the lateral ventricles. As has been pointed out by the previous speaker, we look for ventricular megaly in the transventricular plane. And it's not actually the posterior complex that we look for in the transventricular, but it's the ventricular megaly which prompts us to have a look at the posterior complex. Because the moment we see ventricles are abnormal, we have a look at the brain in detail and automatically look for the posterior complex, which is in a slightly cranial plane. As you can see here, these are two cases of ventricular megaly. And uh, as you already know, uh, how ventricular megaly can be measured. So I won't uh, dwell on that much. And this is a case of mild ventricular megaly and this a case of moderate ventricular megaly. Uh, why is it important to determine the uh, ventricular megaly? Because obviously the counseling will depend on the extent of ventricular megaly. When you're placing calipers, it's important to stick to the landmarks because you can see in this case, when calipers have been placed at three different positions, we've got three different measurements. And hence, we don't know whether to call the lateral ventricle moderately or to call it severely dilated. Now, if you remember the points which have been uh, highlighted in the previous presentation, out of these three measurements, this would actually be the most appropriate because it is at the level of this parieto occipital sulcus, which serves as the landmark for the atrium of the lateral ventricle. And we are supposed to measure the lateral ventricle at the level of the atrium, placing the calipers uh, on the inner margins. So this would be the most appropriate measurement giving a ventricular megaly more than 15 millimeters. So this is severe ventricular megaly. Had I placed the calipers a bit more posteriorly in the occipital horn, it would have become moderate. And it's important that we stratify or categorize the ventricular megaly properly because the subsequent counseling and uh, neurodevelopmental outcome depends uh, on the extent of ventricular megaly besides presence of associated findings. So based on the width of the atrium, the ventricular megaly may be mild when it ranges from 10 to 12 millimeters, moderate when it is more than 12 and up to 15 millimeters, and severe when it's more than 15 millimeters. Uh, the reason it's uh, good to stratify ventricular megaly as mild or moderate is because when there is isolated mild or moderate ventricular megaly, uh, such that there is no other structural abnormality in the brain, it has been observed that moderate ventricular megaly tends to have a little uh, less favorable outcome than isolated mild ventricular megaly. Now what next? When you see ventricular megaly, you would obviously perform an extended neurosonogram, evaluate the supra and infratentorial brain and uh, see the brain in, uh, brain in all the three planes. Uh, not only confine yourself to the brain, but do a detailed fetal evaluation because remember we need to determine the cause so uh, we would perform a detailed ultrasound and there would be further testing, which would probably be uh, highlighted better in the next presentation. So I would confine myself to just the role of fetal MR uh, in mild ventricular megaly. Now, it has been observed that when uh, performed in uh, experienced hands, uh, fetal MR doesn't yield much in cases of vent mild ventricular megaly before 24, 24 weeks of gestation. So if you've done a good neurosonogram before 24 weeks of gestation, you can be reasonably confident that you won't get pretty much any information on a fetal MR. The role of fetal MR is mainly confined to after 24 weeks. When uh, cortical maturation takes place, the brain becomes more complex with the development of sulcation and gyration. And there, when there is limitation uh, you know, in the sonographic technique because of this advanced gestation, there is brain sh uh, shadowing of the brain and there's difficulty in imaging the brain. 
So that's why the role of fetal MR is mainly confined to the late, late second or the third trimester. Now, this was referred as a case of mild ventriculomegaly with the ventricle measured as 11 millimeters. So first look at the image and you see, feel that something is off. Is this really ventriculomegaly? No, it's not. This was actually a case of choroid plexus cyst, which has been considered as ventriculomegaly. I'll show you another case, another case of a choroid plexus cyst. These are both choroid plexus cysts and they should not be confused with ventriculomegaly. Now I'll have an image of ventriculomegaly in comparison. So uh, to avoid this pitfall of calling a large choroid plexus cyst filling the lateral ventricle uh, as ventriculomegaly, you just need to keep two points in mind. First, see the shape of the lateral ventricle. As you can see, this is a case of moderate ventriculomegaly, which you just saw a few slides back. When there is ventriculomegaly, there's just simple fluid within the ventricle, so the shape of the ventricle is preserved. Whereas when there's a large choroid plexus cyst filling the lateral ventricle, the ventricle gets a more rounded configuration. In this case, it has a more oval kind of a configuration. Also, if you look at the choroid plexus, in simple ventriculomegaly, the choroid plexus retains its shape. It just dangles in the lateral ventricle because there's fluid here between the choroid and the medial wall of the lateral ventricle. In contrast, since the choroid plexus cyst is coming from the uh, choroid plexus, it would kind of distort the appearance of the choroid plexus, as you see here. And in this case, the choroid plexus is relatively thin and actually lifted up rather than being dangling as would be expected in ventriculomegaly. So this is how you can uh, differentiate ventriculomegaly from a choroid plexus cyst and avoid this pitfall. Now, obviously, when you see these two images, you don't even need to measure and you're quite sure that these are cases of ventriculomegaly. But what about the etiology? Now, uh, if you see carefully, besides the fact that the ventricles are dilated, you can also appreciate this echogenic lining of the ependema or the ventricular lining seen in both the cases. Both the cases have ventriculomegaly, this echogenic appearance of the ventricular wall, but the cause of ventriculomegaly is different. First is a case of congenital cytomegalovirus infection, while the other is a case of intracranial hemorrhage. So how would you differentiate the two? Well, congenital CMV would present with other sequelae of fetal infection, which I would just discuss subsequently, whereas intracranial hemorrhage would lack those sequelae of infection. Also in this case, if you look closely at the rest of the brain, you can appreciate presence of this echogenic lesion in the brain parenchyma, which is an intraparenchymal hematoma in a case of grade four IVH. Another abnormal appearance. Now we've talked about the size of the lateral ventricle. We've talked about its wall. Let's look at its contents. Sometimes you might see this thin echogenic septum within the occipital horn of the lateral ventricle. Now, is this a choroid plexus cyst? Not at all. The choroid plexus is far away from this. This is quite typical of fetal infection and is actually an intraventricular adhesion seen, uh, which has been described commonly with congenital CMV. So it's important to have a look inside the ventricle as well. Another abnormal appearance. Remember, I talked about looking at the lateral ventricle, but also at the brain parenchyma, that is the periventricular white matter. And as you can appreciate here, though the ventricular size is normal, the periventricular white matter is not. It's supposed to be hypoechoic, whereas here it shows this echogenic cuff, which is again, very typical of fetal infection. Here in this case, the ventricle looks relatively normal, but here there is associated ventriculomegaly and an irregular appearance of the ventricular wall. First was a case of congenital rubella infection. The other was a case of congenital CMV. Other associated findings, which you may see in case of fetal infection, uh, include enlargement of the spleen. There may be associated pericardial effusion or cardiomegaly. Small bowel may be echogenic. The liver may be enlarged. The placenta can be enlarged as well and show multiple calcification. There can be reduction in the lyca and of course, the opacification of the fetal lens, that is fetal cataract. Now, another abnormal appearance. This is the abnormal appearance of the splenium as you can see here from the schematic. So please have a careful look at the video. Obviously, again, to make a diagnosis of this condition, you actually don't need to look at the posterior complex but I still want you to have a look at the posterior complex here. This case was referred as just ventriculomegaly. The ventricle had been measured at, as 10 millimeters. Obviously, from your knowledge of the anterior complex, you can appreciate 
that something is wrong in the anterior complex. The lateral ventricle has a teardrop appearance with colpocephaly. But also you can see how different the posterior complex appears. There is no splenium of the corpus callosum disrupting the interhemispheric fissure. So this is the appearance of the posterior complex in complete agenesis of corp corpus callosum. But if you look at this uh, posterior complex in this fetus at 22 weeks, is this an isolated finding? No, it is not. Another structure which should have been seen here at this period of gestation is not seen, and that is the parieto occipital sulcus. So this is not an isolated condition. It has occurred in combination with delayed sulcation. So remember, when one structure is slightly off, look at the others very carefully. Another abnormal appearance of the posterior complex, this is an image from literature showing this echogenic focus in the splenium of the corpus callosum. This is the a posterior horn of the lateral ventricle. This is the choroid plexus to understand the anatomy better. And on sagittal section, this was confirmed to be a corpus callosal lipoma in the splenium and the posterior body region. So we not only look at the um, size or the presence or absence of the splenium, but also at its echogenicity. And remember, fat is bright on ultrasound. So this is a case of corpus callosal lipoma. Now, sometimes while you are assessing the posterior complex, you might come across this anechoic structure in the midline interhemispheric fissure. Do not get fooled by this appearance and just call it a cyst and move on. Always remember to switch on the par Doppler. And in this case, you can see that this anechoic structure is actually not a cyst, but a vascular malformation a vein of gallon wall malformation. So uh, by now I've shown you a wide variety of spectrum of posterior complex abnormalities. And I would just conclude by saying that the role of uh, ultrasound in posterior complex abnormalities, or for that matter in any abnormality of the fetus is to detect deviations from normal. Once you detect these deviations, do a comprehensive evaluation of the fetus, come to a diagnosis, or if that is not possible, a differential diagnosis, suggests the likely etiology so as to guide further workup. Ultrasound also provides guidance for diagnostic and therapeutic interventions. And sometimes when the abnormality is mild, ultrasound is helpful in follow-ups. With this, I come to the end of this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Deva. Thank you for a very wonderful uh presentation, especially highlighting the very, very crucial points, what to see and what not to miss, especially when we are doing our uh, antenatal scans, as far as the posterior complex was concerned. It was a, indeed a wonderful presentation. I think we'll take up uh, the questions at the end, Dr. Divya. And with that, uh, we move on to the next and the last talk of today's, and that is by Dr. Minakshi. Dr. Minakshi is, has done her OBGYN and she's a DM in medical genetics from SGPJ Lucknow. And she's currently a consultant geneticist at our center. She does hold a lot of awards and achievements. She has been a gold medalist during her undergraduation. She does has a best oral paper award in U of Oxy in the year 2013 and over 30 research papers to her credit. She is a member of various societies, to name a few are the Indian Academy of Medical Genetics, Society of Fetal Medicine, Indian Society of Human Genetics, and Indian Society of Inborn Errors in Metabolism. She has keen interests in prenatal and reproductive genetics and molecular genetics. With that, I invite Dr. Minakshi, and today she'll be talking on genetic counseling and testing in ventricular megaly. Over to Dr. Minakshi. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for the kind introduction. And uh, I would just like to know if my slides are all right, visible to everybody, and I'm audible. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, so, so my topic is uh, genetic counseling and testing in ventricular megaly. So we've made the diagnosis, and uh, but uh, the whole uh, roadmap uh, lies ahead of us. What to do after the diagnosis that it is a ventricular megaly. So I would be dividing my talks into 
firstly defining uh, the definition, the incidence, the etiology, which varies not only from genetic, but also non-genetic factors. And what do you want to check in a case of ventricular megaly, how to go about the management and the genetic counseling and the testing, which test to be done, when to be done, and how to prognosticate the pre-test genetic counseling and the post-test genetic counseling as well. And uh, just in the end, a few illustrative cases. So ventricular megaly is one actually defined as one of the commonest, one of the commonest abnormalities that is seen on prenatal ultrasounds. And the incidence varies from 0.3 to around 2% in various ethnicities. And in genetic counseling, you know, in many of the times there is unilateral ventricular megaly, but for genetic counseling and testing, as per the literature, we take it as to, uh, for the unilateral as well as uh, bilateral, we take the same uh, procedures for all testing and counseling purposes because the uh, prognosis does not actually differ basically on the unilateral or bilate, uh, bilateral in case if it is dilated. So first of all started with the etiology part. Uh, it could be a CNS structural malformation, it could be an obstruction like an aqueduct of sylvius obstruction or it could be post hemorrhagic or uh, it could be due to fetal infections. The torch infections are common, uh, the viral infections we know of. The CMV is the most implicated one and the genetic factors, chromosomal and the single gene defects. But you know, when I talk about the CNS structural defects, they are even still genetic because there are certain developmental genes which might lead to blockage, uh, not uh, lead to uh, the patent blockage of the aqueduct of Sylvius, it being not the patent or maybe due to new certain neuronal migration defects, which are though developmental, but there is an underlying genetic etiology. So genetic testing and counseling is very important for the structural as well as for the other genetic cause ones. So the structural lesions could be due to a, you know, obstruction of the CSF flow or the neuronal migration disorders, the agenesis of certain structures as we've, as we've seen in the previous talks or due to certain destructive processes, which could be infective as, as well, or it could be uh, post hemorrhagic. So uh, uh, as uh, discussed by Dr. Meethan and Dr. Uh, Divya, it is very uh, important, you know, to have a very good ultrasound, uh, an ultrasound which we have confidence in because the whole of the genetic counseling and subsequent testing is going to be decided. The foundation is going to be laid down by that. So uh, it is very, very important. Uh, and the prognostication, the severity, gestational age is also going to matter a lot. And because the structural lesions are still ge uh, underlying genetics, so still in these cases, you know, I see a lot of reports in which it is says, okay, it is due to obstructive cause. And sometimes the OBGYN might think, okay, it's an obstructive ventriculomegaly, you know, so nothing genetic required, no. Because aqueduct of sylvius blockage is a very important, it's one of the uh, lesions that we see so commonly in the L1 cam uh, gene mutations. The incidence is, you know, not very, very rare. It's one in 30,000 births. And in a country like India, one in 30,000 is going to yield a, a, such a large chunk to you. So even if you have obstructive lesions, think genetic in those cases also. So uh, uh, going by the same point, so if I have an obstruction at the equiductal stenosis, the four genes have been associated and the extinct ones are L1 CAM and the AP1S2 uh, and the autosomal recessive ones are the CCDC, 88C and MPDZ. Why I'm telling that there are certain X-linked and the certain autosomal recessive ones? Because, you know, uh, my counseling is going to change. The risk of reoccurrence in this pregnancy, uh, the risk of reoccurrence for the next pregnancy is going to change by this inheritance pattern. Uh, the fem extended family screen is going to change by this pattern. So, um, and yes, uh, when Whenever we do genetic testing, sometimes we don't get any results, but uh, this is, you know, due to the technological limitations, there are certain, some things more which are yet to be discovered. So uh, always uh, this has to be kept in mind that even in aqueductal stenosis, please think genetic. So uh, just a very little touch upon, upon the fetal intrauterine infections. Uh, so yes, torch agents are there. CMV is very important. And in CMV, you usually see mild to moderate initially. FGR might be seen. The other viral markers may be seen. It's a very common cause of post-SNHL in children. Amniotic fluid, CMV, PCR has to be done, of course, after a maternal uh, torch test for IgM and IgG. 
um now coming on to the main part the genetic causes of ventricular megaly so whenever i am discussing the genetic causes i would like to you know segregate into the, it into the chromosomal causes and the single gene causes why uh, uh, because it it makes understanding easier it makes testing easier so uh, whenever i am thinking of a, a chromosomal causes the set of test is, tests uh, required is different and when i'm thinking of single gene causes the set of testing required is different so for trisomy uh, uh, still uh, you know a good chunk of ventricular megaly mild to moderate it's still uh, uh, usually due is due to trisomy 21 so uh, it should be ruled out and uh, isolated also and trisomy 13 but you, it is usually complex complex means that i will get something i will get microphthalmias i will get polydactylies i might get some cardiac defects Uh, when i'm thinking about trisomy 13 so there are certain copy number variations copy number variations means there is there are certain micro deletions or duplications in the genome which can uh, give rise to this ventricular megaly and if there are small cnvs uh, smaller micro deletions or duplications they might lead to an isolated defect but if there are larger cnvs they will lead to because see if there are larger cnvs a larger number of genes are going to be involved and this is going to lead more likely a complex picture complex picture means uh, there would be ventricular megaly plus other systemic defects found on the ultrasound so in this cases i would like to uh, test uh, the chromosomes now the question is what do i test do i do a microarray or do i do a karyotype so uh, this is a very important question we need to address first of all uh, the thing is that what is the incidence okay i saw a patient who has mild ventricular megaly what do i tell the patients or or the uh, referring doctor what is why should you actually test it because the incidence of chromosomal abnormalities is as high as 9% for the mild ones but for the severe ones it is 5% so uh, doesn't it look like conflicting like uh, for the chromosomal ones why is it lower for the severe ones because the single gene defects are more prevalent in the single uh, in the severe ventricular megaly group testing is required but you know based upon the phenotype my testing strategy is going to change so uh, the same thing more single gene defects like uh, muscular the alpha dystrocho dystroglycanopathies the l1 cam celiopathies come into picture in the severe ventricular megaly and the chromosomal ones uh, might not uh, progress but the single gene ones especially those involve the other structures of the cns they would progress throughout the gestation Uh, and if it is a complex ventricular megaly non isolated then the yield of my chromosomal testing is would be much higher as compared to the uh, isolated ventricular megaly 16% versus 10% so the crux is that if i have a patient with mild to moderate ventricular megaly with other anomalies involved like heart face limbs other anomalies then there is a likely more chance that i would detect a chromosomal abnormalities as compared to if it is only cns involvement only ventricular megaly and a severe ventricular megaly in that case i should be thinking about those alpha dystroglycanopathies l1 cam celiopathies sloss and other things so uh what how to go about it should i choose a microarray or should i choose a karyotype so there are certain let us consider the pros and the cons so for microarray uh, the yield of microarray is definitely much see microarray and karyotype are both going to look at all the 46 chromosomes so microarray will give you more yield because it is not a subjective technique it is objective machine based technique which has a higher resolution so it has if it will give you the copy number variations which might likely not be picked up with karyotype they say that the resolution of karyotype is around 5 mega bases but i very commonly i see in the opds that even around 10 12 even 30 mbs are missed sometimes on karyotype and you would say why because you know uh, what uh, if any of if we see the karyotype it is actually th there are bands on the chromosomes and there are certain regions of chromosomes which you know appear very similar so in those regions the bands are not very well defined and in those regions you can miss even the larger cnvs and it is actually a subjective technique so microarray definitely has a higher yield 
uh, but the um, major thing is this yes vus can be detected so one thing you, you can do to uh, reduce the vus vus are actually the variants of uncertain significance that means that i am getting some finding in the microarray but that is not associated with ventricular megaly and there is conflicting literature then what to do how do i counsel the patients so in that case parental studies help but you know the parental studies will cost additional time and costing so this should be explained to the patient beforehand and one thing you can there are certain things that we can do to reduce the vus i can uh, uh, order the lower resolution microarray i can go for focused one uh no uh, karyotype how is uh, there are certain advantages of the karyotype as well so we cannot you know throw the karyotype uh, right now and just shift all together to the microarray because it will tell you about the mosaicism which is very important so we, we had a patient with chromosome 19 mosaicism the microarray was absolutely normal because the mosaicism was less than 30% only the karyotype helped us in that case so you cannot actually let go of the karyotype as all the balanced translocation you would not be pick up of course you are not thinking of them when you are looking at an abnormal uh, fetus and uh, uh, so sometimes uh, i would say after a good counseling if you are thinking of mosaic forms of tri trisomy 13 18 especially it is a good idea to run a karyotype also along with but yes counseling the patient beforehand is very very important so the main things karyotype versus microarray look at the uh, discuss about the yield of microarray detection the strength of karyotype is the mosaicism detection and the vus how do we reduce the vus on microarray so this slide is just to show the power of microarray over karyotype in these ventricular megaly cases so this was a meta analysis study in which they uh, you see in these all do you see all of these karyotypes are normal but the microarray has uh, um, detected abnormalities and because the microarray was abnormal so parent parental testing had to be done see all the 16 11p2 micro deletion syndrome led to a mic uh, leads to ultimately an autistic phenotype in the child it would have been missed with a simple karyotype here similarly this uh, would have been missed the, the non syndromic uh, this 9q um, um, duplication would have been missed so there are certain points um, these uh, so this is actually a right time you know to shift gears from karyotype to microarray in the right situations uh similarly here also we can see the trisomy 21 okay the microarray you don't need the karyotype is picking it up but here in all these cases again these micro deletion duplication syndromes which will present with developmental delay later on in the childhood have been reported normally by the karyotype right and in certain cases see they are inherited from the paternal or uh, the father had them so this makes our counseling very very difficult so that's actually a different topic for the different day uh, but yes the, uh, parental uh, what i want you to remember is that after a microarray if you do there is something called vus and we have to we might have to go back to parental studies as well so again the same uh yes this shows the this here uh, the microarray is normal the fetus is abnormal but there is a translocation uh this translocation will not be detected by microarray but uh, what they hypothesize is that there was a gene which was broken so th there is a segment from chromosome 10 which is translocating to 17 so there was a break in the gene at that segment which led to this so if i went go through a karyotype or maybe a single gene uh, uh, testing i might not be able to pick it up so see the karyotype help us, uh, uh, helped us here so the genetic testing is complementary microarray is very powerful but there are certain domains it will not help us and karyotype is required now coming on to the second things the single gene disorders causing ventricular megaly they are very very important you know because day in i see so many cases where it is a clear cut single gene cause of ventricular megaly and the testing has been stopped at a normal microarray so the patient has uh, done a microarray and the microarray's report is normal the patient is assured the gynecologist is assured but it reoccurs again of course it would reoccur again because it could be a recessive cause right so the test chosen was not the correct one and uh, the commonest single gene disorders causing ventricular megaly are uh, the obstructive causes 
the Joubert uh, syndrome and the other celiopathies in which you see dandy walkers, cerebellar and vermian defects, cystic kidneys, polydactyly, neuronal migration defects uh, with different uh, gyration sulcation defects, uh, one of which is Zellweger syndrome, megalencephaly, Warburg micro syndrome, and the alpha distro glycopathies. So as you see, each of this group has a different uh, involvement of different systems. So ultrasound, a good ultrasound can actually help us in the differentials very well. And that could help us in choosing the right test. Uh, again, I've just highlighted this, that see, these are different conditions which present with antenatal uh, ventricular megaly, but they have such a different involvement of the different systems that the uh, uh, ultrasound is really going to give us a good differential diagnosis and simplify our genetic testing, a timely genetic test. So always go for phenotype-based genetic testing. A good detail level two is a must. Fetal echo would help us. A maternal history, especially for infections, the occupational history. Is she a school teacher? Is she a healthcare worker? The torch testing. If, if you don't have torch, ask, take out all the records. If, she, if there are previous IgG positive records pre-pregnancy, they would help us to exclude the infections. A three-generation family history. Sometimes they would just not tell you. And there is a history in the maternal uncle or there is a history of consanguinity so that you needs to be poked out and elicited from the family so all this exercise is for us to uh, make a list of our differential diagnosis so uh, that would help in the genetic counseling because we you know we have to chart out our management we have to give a prognostication to the patient because our patients want us because the testing is so costly it is time consuming they want us to narrow down on some form of uh, some prognosis you know if i have um, okay we'll be discussing that in uh, subsequent slides so if i have a patient with mild ventricular megaly and hypoplastic nasal bone so i am suspecting trisomy 21 and i would go for a karyotype or a microarray here but if i have a moderate ventricular megaly with a cardiac defect i may be thinking of a copy number variation here and i would go for a microarray preferably the low risk resolution ones to avoid the VUS here. So if it is a mild ventricular megaly, these are actually oversimplified scenarios. <laughs> these do not occur in common. The, the, the scenarios are not so simplified in the actual practice. So if it is a mild ventricular megaly with uh, FGR uh, uh, growth restriction and parenchymal uh, calcification, and, fee, and the woman has a torch positive report, this is usually not there. The torch reports do not really help us because there is so much lab ambiguity and there are previous reports are not there for the IG levels for us to check. So here is something we would do is a CMV PCR. Always remember CMV PCR has to be done at an interval of six weeks from infection or around 20 weeks. Some people say even 22 weeks amniocentesis because by that time the fetal diuresis is established. But our PNDT Act, we cannot wait for so long, so long but at least 20 weeks. So if it is an equiductal stenosis, agenesis of corpus callosum, here I would not send a karyotype uh, definitely because I'm thinking of a single gene etiology. So my uh, management in mild or moderate ventricular megaly would be as discussed, all these things. Uh, MRI has been very well discussed. And if it is severe, severe ventricular megaly, you know, I might not, not tell them about amniocentesis and everything. I might tell that, okay, this is has a poor prognostic, but fetal autopsy is very, very important here. I would be showing you a few cases where fetal autopsy helped us so much in reaching a genetic diagnosis. Uh, if, if they cannot afford to go for an entire genetic test, Testing at the rate, uh, right uh, there and then, please go for a DNA storage. They can always come back for a uh, testing later on. But you know, the DNA would be lost later on. So prognosis depends upon grade. If it is mild or severe, as in as a part of my genetic counseling, it is my duty to uh, tell them about the prognosis. And if other if it is isolated ventricular megaly or there are other systems that are involved, and yes, I have to tell them about the progression and what is progression. Definitely, uh, we have to do uh, uh, do serial ultrasounds. But I know that in around thirty percent, it might not progress, and the underlying etiology is. Very very important to prognosticate.
so uh, if it is a uh, mild uh, ventricular megaly and we rule out all the causes then you know it has actually a very good prognosis 95% to some even say 98% have a normal neurodevelopmental outcome these children at birth and uh, the residual is actually around 2 to 3 percent uh, children have a developmental delay, so it's just like the normal population. But in uh, moderate ventricular megaly, the neurodevelopmental outcome is abnormal in 20 percent, and in severe, it is more or less uh, actually not a good outcome. Uh, same things. So in mild ventricular megaly, 3 to 4, 4 percent are associated with chromosomal abnormalities, 6 percent with structural abnormalities, 1 to 5 percent with uh, fetal infections, uh, a, a good neurodevelopmental outcome. But in severe, see all the figures go so bad. It is really an, uh, not a good outcome. So, but it is such a difficult call, you know, to call at 20 or 24 weeks, then it appears mild, but we do not know how it is going to progress after four weeks. So yes, these lesions are challenging. And uh, so the genetic testing does help us because if I get a uh, normal uh, genetic report, uh, I rule out the single gene causes, then I might think I, I might be able to tell them that this might not progress very well. Uh, so again, uh, the rate of progression they regress 34 percent but usually the mild ones only regress and uh, 56 percent remain stable and the these children do very well and uh, for the subsequent pregnancy how do i counsel the patients for subsequent uh, pregnancy for this pregnancy i have to know the etiology was it chromosomal or single gene and depending upon that the risk of reoccurrence for their next pregnancy is going to vary from 0 to 25 percent right and uh, the reproductive options can only be uh, discussed after a diagnosis is established and they vary from a cvs from ivf pgt or a donor egg or sperm and in case I am not able to identify any etiology, there is always an empirical risk of reoccurrence from literature that we quote around 2 to 5%. Uh, fetal therapy, there are ventricular amniotic shunt placements have been tried, but the results are not encouraging. Very few centers do it and the developmental outcome is not uh, good. So there's not actually much point dis uh, discussing it. So, uh, so this fetus came to us after termination. It was a male fetus with adducted thumbs, ventricular megaly, agenesis of corpus callosum, hyperplastic cerebellum, and it was a plain, simple obstruct uh, L1 cam mutation. And mother was a carrier, so it was X-linked, and you know X-linked. So the mother is carrier again. Chances of having an affected male fetus and extended testing in her sisters become important. So again, this was a fetus with severe ventricular megaly. As we can see in the autopsy specimen also, the brain mantle is so thin. The guy, the guy appears so simple. And here we found out this uh, mutation in this B4GAT1 gene, which is a congenital muscular, muscular, uh, muscular dystroglycanopathy. And it is actually the third reported, uh, we published this. This is third reported case in uh, literature and unfortunately this patient came to us again for genetic testing and it was affected again so here something we can advise her is pgt or donor um, definitely the risk of reoccurrence is 25 percent only but it becomes very harassing and as you can see by the history you know this was actually her third pregnancy that was affected so uh, these testing were in the fetus. Now, uh, this was the baby who came to me, a preterm born girl who came to me uh, at around, uh, she was she was one month uh, old baby girl. And in her ultrasound, there was mild ventricular megaly. Her uh, uh, ultrasound, last ultrasound showed mild ventricular megaly, agenesis of corpus callosum. And you know, her level two was absolutely fine. And these pa parents were very agitated. The level two was fine, what happened? Why was it not caught so it, it also becomes very important you know because cns is an, it's an evolving system uh, to make the patients understand this thing so here in the last trimester it was picked up and when we tested the baby post birth so we uh, found out this dcc gene was mutated and this causes mirror movement agenesis of corpus callosum syndrome and the good thing about this is uh, 
that the prognosis is actually good in this case. They have either mild intellectual disability or even lead a normal life. The risk of reoccurrence is also very less, just 1%. Gunit germline mosaicism has not been seen, but yes, I would definitely uh, test in the next pregnancy as well, just to rule it out. But you can just appreciate that between case, to, comparing case two and three, how the prognosis is so much different and how the risk of reoccurrence is uh, so different. So the uh, message that I would finally want to convey is that in ventriculum megaly, the prognosis will depend upon mild versus moderate versus severe. Moderate and severe, definitely a bad prognosis, isolated or complex, mild, isolated with normal chromosomes and maybe if uh, after uh, uh, discussing, after uh, uh, genetic counseling, they do opt for clinical exome and everything is fine and there is a good chance it will not progress and they will have a very good outcome. So genetic testing and counseling will help the couples to prognosticate and manage not only this pregnancy, but also in the reoccurrence in next pregnancy. And how can I offer genetic counseling and testing? It can be prenatal, like a patient comes to me with ventricular megaly, we might do an amniocentesis. It could be postnatal. I identify so severe ventricular megaly, we decide not to continue, but a fetal autopsy is done. And sometimes the couples come with just the reports that the previous child had this. And those couples also we can help because in those couples, I can do a couple expanded carrier screen or, uh, or I can look at their records for, uh, just to establish you know, was it infectious? Was it a single gene? Or was it chromosomal? We can uh, offer the uh, testing in the couple to uh, to help them, uh, you know, estimate was was the etiology and uh, establish the reoccurrence. Uh, so, thank you, everyone. Uh, lots of loads of information. <laughs> I understand. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Minakshi, for a wonderful uh, genotype and phenotype association and the importance of, uh, you know, going about ultrasound and then, you know, asking for a particular test. That's very, very crucial one. And that, of course, helps in the way we counsel our patients. So thank you for a very elaborate uh, description on uh, ventricular megaly. And now we have a few of the questions. I think you can just go to the QA box. And uh, the first question is by Dr. Kavita, where she wishes to know about counseling for isolated asymmetric mild hydrocephalus. I think this is for you only, uh, Dr. Minakshi. Uh, so even if it is, you know, asymmetric mild, firstly, if it is mild, that is between 10 to 12, I would want to know what is the gestational age at what you're talking about. So if it is at, if it is a mild ventricular megaly at 37 weeks, and I would like to know what the structure, other structures on the ultrasound, have you seen the corpus callosum properly, the cerebellum, vermis and everything is fine. If it is written isolated, I presume it is mild and uh, genetic testing has been done or not. So if uh, the chromo if it is isolated mostly our genetic testing chromosomes in single genes come out to be normal and it has a good prognosis in 95 percent cases and it usually does not progress so the genetic uh, 23 weeks no genetic testing 10.2 so i think uh, if no genetic testing 23 weeks 10.2 i would say it would it should have a good prognosis but yes you would have to follow up to see how it progresses but it should have a good prognosis Right. I think it's a good idea to do a detailed uh, neurosonogram and assess for the adjacent uh, structures too. Of course, uh, the next question is by Dr. Deepika Garg, where she has asked, I have a patient with previous child who's affected with CP, autism and Down syndrome. Which test should I suggest her? Yeah, so... Uh... Is it CP, is it autism or it's a Down syndrome? Because all three are different. So I presume it is Down syndrome. So if it is Down syndrome, uh, then we have to look at her, the child stereotype. 95% of 90% of them would be uh, uh, free trisomy. The risk of reoccurrence is only 0.8%. But if it is a translocation, depending upon uh, whom the translocation has been inherited from, it would vary from 5 to 15%. So uh, just share the, the child stereotype. And if it is a CP, it's actually not a CP unless you investigate the child genetically because CP is a diagnosis of exclusion. Uh, so I would want to have a look at the child, all the reports, everything. It, believe me, CP is most of the times not CP. 
and autism autism you have to rule out fragile x you have to rule out copy number variations so a good detailed examination in cases of cp and autism a good detailed examination of the child has to be done and if we rule out the genetic factors then the risk of reoccurrence for autism is around empirical is around 8 to 18% for down syndrome if it is free less than 1% if it is a translocation 5 to 15% cp i would want to investigate it is if it is actually cp and hie injury then it should not reoccur with a good antenatal care uh, she has emphasized that the child is 8 years old and uh, is affected with autism and cp so she has just put a word yeah so uh, uh, so dr dipika i think uh, we should uh, look at uh, the mri picture because uh, cp children have a particular hie uh, picture on the mri i would like to see if it is static or if the thing is progressing because autism and cp is very different uh, and uh, okay if, if if we say if i presume that all the genetic testing has been done and it is normal then i would give a figure of recurrence rate of around 8 to 18% but i would like to look at the child and the records right thank you there's another question uh, if you could just go and see how do we know this is mosaic trisomy and do a karyotype if doing micro if if we are thinking of mosaicism because mosaicism affects a few number of cell lines and not the entire cell lines then we are thinking of a milder phenotype so uh, uh, if i am talking about a case like if uh, there was a patient with only uh, there was a fetus with only rocker bottom feet and uh, uh, and then uh, i am and cp cyst then i am thinking of uh, you know trisomy 18 but uh, why is all the cardiac defects polydactyly cns defects not there so here i can think of a mosaic uh, phenotype so in that case i would say a fish and a kt and if it is normal then a microarray can be done later on so that can be done so mosaic we usually think when there is a milder phenotype as compared to what we are expecting and it is very easy actually you know to suspect mosaicism when you see a child in a fetal case it is difficult but yes milder cases you can think of a mosaic phenotype true So there's another question. Thirty-six years primary, thirteen weeks and three days. NT is one point four mm with a one in five risk for trisomy twenty-one after a dual test. Which test should be offered after MNU? I think that she wants to know which test should be offered. Only karyotyping or more? I think if the ultrasound, if she is thirteen weeks, you know, we should do a early anomaly scan at sixteen weeks, and if that is normal, then karyotype would suffer suffice in this case. Right. So with that, <clears throat> we have uh, no more questions, and uh, thank you all the speakers for a lovely evening, and I thank all the delegates too for joining us for today's uh, webinar. and uh, with that i thank dr minakshi dr divya singh dr meethan for taking out their time and the delegates too thank you so much and over to uh, ms geeta thank you thank you dr nagin so uh, on behalf of uh, medgenome team i would like to thank uh, Uh, Doctor, uh, our speakers, uh, Doctor Meethan, Doctor Divya, and Doctor Minakshi, and special th thanks to you, ma'am, Doctor Larvin, for supporting us. And uh, I would just like to say that this is, you know, we have a couple of more webinars coming up with this series, so stay stay tuned for more. And all the videos will be available on our YouTube channel. You can go to a uh, YouTube channel of Med Genome to view these videos. And uh, if there are any more questions or any more doubts, uh, you can reach out to us at diagnostic. Six at the rate mentioned on .com. So with that, uh, I'd like to thanks uh, you know thank everyone for attending the webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye.